Good. Well, we're back in our Kingdom Christianity series, and um, as we've talked about, there's six cylinders that are part of this whole Kingdom uh, message that we're focusing on. And today I'm looking at the last one of those, which has to do with our witness, our outreach, uh, loving in an inclusive way, our world and our community. And I've entitled it, Each One Reach One. And before we uh, open the word, I'd just like us to pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you that uh, you are so good to us. You love us so much and you want your love to flow through us to others. And we want that too. So we pray for more of that in each one of our lives. And we also pray that you'll touch each person here today just as they need to be touched by you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story is told of a new pastor who was called to a small church in a small Midwestern town. I believe his name was Roger, but uh, I'm not positive about that. But South Dakota, yes, that's, that works. But... Um, Anyway, this church was dying, and he was kind of called in as the last hope for the church. And uh, so it was such a small town that he decided to spend the first week visiting every single house in that small town, introducing himself and inviting the people to come to his first service the following Sunday. And uh, so when he arrived at church Sunday, he was anticipating a big crowd. But unfortunately, the place was just virtually empty like it had been. It didn't seem like the visiting did any good at all. So uh, he decided to put an ad in the little town newspaper the next week that said, uh, come to the funeral of Christ Community Church. This is a, a different Christ Community Church. Uh, not the same one, but uh, anyway, come to the funeral. Um, the church is dead, and we need to properly bury it. So out of uh, just morbid curiosity, most of the town showed up that next Sunday to see how they were going to bury this church. And uh, Pastor Roger did his eulogy, and they had a big casket, but it was a closed casket with a bunch of flowers on it. And after he finished his eulogy, he opened up the casket and he said, I, I think it's only right that each of you should pay your last respects to this church. So we'll close the service by inviting each of you to come up. And so again, people's curiosity got the best of them. They wanted to see you know, what in the world is going to represent a dead church? And so they filed up and one by one walked up to the casket, looked down into it, and they all just kind of guilt-ridden, sheepishly walked away, looking embarrassed. And uh, the pastor, who was a very creative type, like our own Roger, uh, had put perfectly tilted in the right way a mirror so every person saw their own face as they uh, walked by that casket and uh, that was enough to prompt the community to actually start coming back to that church and it didn't die after all no. only someone like Roger could think of something like think of something like that but um, you know when, it, when a community church dies it can be argued that uh, the whole community plays a role in that death and um, I know when we first moved into this building, it was my goal to visit every single house in this city. And we got a whole list of them. And uh, I actually made it to about 800 houses. Those are the ones on all four sides. I didn't make it to the whole city. But one reason I didn't was because I was getting no results from <laughs> the houses I, I did visit. Um, it was fun to talk to people and see what church they attended. And, but, you know, I would invite people here who didn't have a church home. And I think there were only two people who ever came here as a result of that. Now, David has actually stayed with us, but, but he actually started coming before I visited his house. So I can't really, uh, I visited his house after he started coming, but I, I can't take credit for him coming here. He used to attend this church. So when we came into the building, uh, he decided he just lives two doors down. So 
he decided to walk over here and we've enjoyed having him with us. But, um, you know, it's, it's easy to find reasons or excuses uh, why we haven't grown as much as we may wish that we had over the last eight years of our existence. But, um, you know, that doesn't help us move into the future. And uh, what I don't really perseverate much about size. I, I'm not a person who wants to be pastor of a mega church or anything like that. So, um, you know, that's not something I dwell on. But certainly when we look at our six cylinders, uh, one of the important things is reaching out and, and touching people's lives and experiencing growth as a church. And uh, one of those is cylinders, as I say, is radical inclusive love and witness for the kingdom of God. So I want us to think about that today. And, um, you know, I was talking to Roger at lunch this week, and he was talking about how some of the big churches really lay a trip on people. You know, if you don't come to our church, you're going to go to hell. And uh, that, that's uh, an effective motivator for a lot of people. Fear is an effective motivator for a lot of religion, but it's not a healthy motivator. And I don't think that it's only unhealthy churches that grow. You know, we look at Bethel. They've grown tremendously, and I think they're a very healthy church. I, I think they have a very powerful kingdom message. And, and there are many other kingdom churches. You know, Joseph Prince has a worldwide kingdom church. So you can be a large church without using fear or or unhealthy motivations to grow your church. But I want to make three points this morning. Number one, numbers are not an accurate measure of how God sees a church. I think we'd all agree on that. Jesus had a church of about 12 solid people, you know, when he finished his ministry. And when he had the opportunity to turn that into a mega church, after feeding the 5,000, they all followed him across the lake, and they said, we'll follow you everywhere, anywhere, wherever you go. And uh, what did Jesus do? You know, he scared them off. He offended them. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you've got no part with me. <laughs> Jesus hadn't read the church growth books or something. He uh, <laughs> didn't quite have that down. But uh, John 6:66, 6, interesting verse 666. John 6:66 6, 6, 6 says that many of his followers walked away to, to be with him no more after that. That was just too much for them. Uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That didn't go over too well. But um, numbers have never been God's thing. First Samuel 14.6 talks about how Jonathan and his armor bearer came up against the whole Philistine army and wiped them out, basically. God used these two guys to wipe out the whole Philistine army. And uh, Jonathan said uh, to his armor bearer, come, let us go against the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So God's not about numbers. Uh, it's not about how many. Uh, size doesn't matter to God. But it does to most people. You know, when, when people ask me what I do and if I say I'm a pastor and I'm a psychologist, uh, the first question is always, well, what size is your church? You know, that, that's always uh, the human question that comes through first and foremost. Uh, human beings are very much about size and how big a church is. And um, I talked to a former member of ours uh, that I love dearly, and uh, they went back to Adventism, and uh, I was asking him how things were going. And, and I said, so are, are, have you kind of re-embraced Adventist beliefs? And he said, no, no, I, I believe the same way uh, the kingdom KLF believes. But, you know, it's just so much easier with kids and school and jobs and all the things that are out there to be part of a system. And, and I think that's true. You know, there's no question about that. If, if our little church folds, we don't have a whole system of other churches to go to. And we don't have schools, and we don't have all the other support system and jobs. And so for a lot of people, uh, size does matter. 
And uh, even if the foundations of a movement might be a bit sketchy, even if there are problems with the founder, um, you know, you can always say, hey, look, there's 1.1 million of us in this country. So uh, that must speak for itself. And uh, that argument has its problems because uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses have 2.5 million in the United States. So they're more than twice as big as Adventism. And, um, you know, they're more perceived to be a cult than Adventists are, certainly. But uh, when, when you look at uh, Charles Russell, who was the founder of the Jehovah's Witness, um, he, he got his start in a, with Adventists. Uh, George Storrs was an Adventist who very much influenced him. And he was an Aryan because of George Storrs and... Um, James White, and, and several of the early Adventist leaders were strong Arians. I don't know if you know that or not. But an Arian is one who does not believe that Jesus is God, which, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses emphasize. But um, many of the early Adventist pioneers and leaders were Arians. And, uh, you know, Charles Taze Russell came out of this group. And um, he, he was a person that, just to be kind, you know, uh, was guilty of all kinds of fraud and, and problems that were, you know, very significant. Not only money fraud, but he claimed to have ministerial credentials when he didn't. He claimed to be seminary educated when he wasn't, even in court saying these things. Claimed to know Greek when he didn't know it. So they started showing him the Greek stuff and he doesn't know any of it. Uh, claimed to be ordained when he wasn't. Um, and he defrauded a lot of people in business. So he had something that was called miracle wheat that was supposedly this, you know, like snake oil, going to heal all, all goods and charge an exorbitant amount for it. And he was pretty charismatic and knew how to sell stuff like this. But, you know, you look at that foundation and beginning and founder, and there's still 2.5 million Jehovah's Witnesses, many of them very sincere. And, you know, someone was asking me the other day, do you have to be a, a kingdom Christian to be anointed with the Holy Spirit? And, and I'd say absolutely not. You know, God knows the heart. God knows there are people in the Jehovah's Witness faith who have an incredible heart for him, and he fills them with his Holy Spirit. And that's true in Mormonism, it's true in Adventism, it's, it's true in Buddhism, um, you know, it, it's true with groups of people all over the world. God knows the heart. And uh, it is God who fills people with the Holy Spirit because of their heart for him and their belief in him. But um, anyway, um, if you go to Latter-day Saints, it's six times as big as Adventism. Uh, six in the United States, not worldwide, because Adventists are a little bit bigger than uh, Mormons worldwide. But in the U.S., it's 6.1 Latter-day Saints, 6.1 million. And again, you, you look at the founder, Joseph Smith, what a crazy character this guy was. Uh, you ought to read Brody's book, No Man Knows My History. There, there's a lot of very interesting books about Mormonism, secret ceremonies, uh, books that if you want to be informed, uh, you should read. But... Um, Anyway, Joseph Smith was ar arrested and convicted in New York City and found guilty of being a con artist, an imposter, uh, guilty of necromancy, and being a charlatan, um, all four years before he published the Book of Mormon. So he had all these criminal uh, charges and was found guilty of these things. Necromancy is a, an occult practice of speaking to the dead, and he was into that. But um, anyway, after publishing the Book of Mormon, he, he, there were all kinds of charges of fraud, criminal activity. He shot two people with a gun, killed them. Um, he was arrested for treason and convicted of treason and was waiting to be uh, put to death uh, for treason when a bunch of men broke into the jail and hung him uh, because they were so angry that he had uh, defiled their wives and their daughters. So uh, this is the guy who founded, you know, Mormonism. And, and yet 6.1 million. 
So just because a movement might have a bad foundation, shaky foundation, gross foundation, whatever it happens to be, doesn't mean that they can't grow. And, and there, it doesn't mean there aren't some wonderful Mormons in the world. You know, we rented to Mormons for a while, and when they couldn't pay their rent, the church just stepped in and paid their rent every month. I was pretty amazed. Uh, you know, the church takes care of people in many ways that are quite, quite startling. But uh, my point is that numbers really have nothing to do with necessarily having a good, solid foundation or or being biblical or uh, coming from where God wants us to be coming from. And God is not impressed with numbers. That's why he puts David up against Goliath and the entire Philistine army and wipes them out. Uh, that's why he keeps telling Gideon to get rid of people and his band till the numbers are down to ridiculous odds that are a total joke, but not to God. You know, he still comes through. But, um, you know, the point is, numbers are not an accurate measure of how God sees a church. But, um, you know, numbers are numbers. And uh, the second point is the one that I really want us to think about. Number two, a lack of growth is generally an indicator of poor church health. You know, if we're not really growing at a decent pace, if there's not really healthy growth, that does say that something's wrong. You know, because Jesus did come to give us abundant life, John 10.10. 10. And where there is life, there will be growth. Uh, you can't have life without having growth, individually and corporately. And, um, you know, I think that applies to a church just like it applies to anything else, that we want to have healthy growth. And... Um, our growth has certainly been modest. You know, we've had a little bit of growth over our eight years here. But uh, the people who've moved and had to leave and other things have probably just about offset that growth if they haven't even been greater. And Jesus does say, by your fruits, ye shall know them, Matthew seven twenty. And uh, part of that same passage, he's saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God but those who do the will of my Father. And every good tree will produce good fruit. Notice that it says every, not, not some, not part of them. Uh, it doesn't say may produce, it says will. Every single good tree will produce good fruit. So that's something for us all to you know, reflect on and think about. Are we producing the good fruit that God wants us to? as a spiritual family here. Uh, the New Testament church, of course, saw tremendous growth, Acts 2, 46 and 7. They had a lifestyle Christianity where every day they were having great encounters for the kingdom of God. And it says the Lord added to the church every day those who were being saved. And um, I like that, it's the present progressive those who were being saved. And you might say, well, how, how can you have assurance then? It doesn't Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, tell us that we have been saved? And that's true as well. Uh, both things are true. We have been saved based on the perfect merits of Christ, on his perfect finished work. Noticed it's finished uh, in our behalf. Um, but that releases the Holy Spirit, which is from glory to glory to glory, which is a continual, ongoing, growing process of being in the process of experiencing sozo. And sozo is such a powerful word because it doesn't just include eternal salvation. It includes healing and all the full aspects of being in Christ right now in this world. So both of those passages are true. Uh, they were being saved, and they also had been saved by the blood of Christ. But um, Ephesians 5.18 is right along these same lines. It says, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite verses. Keep on. Again, it's the future perfect. Keep on 
uh, it will continually keep happening. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, we all leak, so we need to keep on being filled. But what does that assume? It assumes that you have been filled. You can't keep on being filled unless you have been filled. And uh, when we talk about being filled or being baptized with the Holy Spirit, that's not just a one-time thing. Just like salvation isn't a one-time date that I point back to. You know, it, it's a continual reality, and the same is true of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing, continual reality. And, um, you know, it would be nice when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit if we all had all the gifts, but that's not how it works. You know, he gave some this gift and others this gift. And I don't know how many in our congregation actually have the gift of evangelism. I don't think I do. Um, Barry might. You know, Barry's pretty good. <laughs> he seems to be pretty gifted at uh, bringing. Yeah, Lori too. Uh, but, you know, that, that's no excuse to not doing the work of the kingdom if we don't have the gift of evangelism. I have to admit I got spoiled when I was a university uh, pastor and chaplain because I taught all the non-Adventist students on the campus every year. Every one of them were required to go through my classes. And uh, so I would teach approximately 200 plus non-Adventist students every year. And uh, I, I didn't even have to mention baptism. I had at least 20 students a year come up to me and want to be baptized. So I got completely spoiled. I baptized more than 500 students during my 20 years at the university. Not because I'm some great evangelist, but uh, because some of them wanted to get into medicine and get into Loma Linda. And no. <laughs> there, there were all kinds of motives why people wanted to get baptized. And, and some of them were pure, I'm sure. But uh, some weren't necessarily pure. But, um, you know, people would get the impression, oh, wow, the chapel, man, he's, he's quite an evangelist. He's always baptizing all these people. But uh, that wasn't the case. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I in many ways I got spoiled from that, that uh, I, I'm not really one that goes out and has an altar call every week or really feels like, uh, you know, I, I need to baptize as many people as I can. And, and I, I probably have a deficit there. You know, I think a lot of pastors... Um, just naturally have an altar call every week and maybe you uh, want me to have one let me know if you do but um, you know it's not that often that we have new people here but but that's something that I'm hoping will change and uh, that's our third point here number three healthy church growth is rooted in the priesthood of all believers it's not rooted in having to have the gift of evangelism because most of us don't. But it is rooted in the healthy understanding of the priesthood of all believers, just like we're talking about buying this church as a priesthood of all believers coming together and all doing what we can. So it is with evangelism in the church. Uh, at prayer meeting this last week, we listened to Alan Scott, who's the new uh, pastor of the Anaheim Vineyard, and I'd never heard him before. And it was a very uh, cool uh, experience. I'm want to start wanting to go to the vineyard again because this guy's very anointed. He comes from Ireland, and um, he just has a, a very. He almost reminds me of John Wimber in many ways. But uh, he talked a little bit about Matthew 10, 7 and 8, and uh, you know this passage talks about as you go, uh, the kingdom. Tell people the kingdom of God has come. You know, it's here. And, and that's as you go. And he's saying, he was talking about how God does all kinds of amazing stuff when we go. But uh, he doesn't necessarily do it in the confines of the church. You know, if we just show up at church every week and we don't go, Jesus said, go ye therefore and share this good news. Um, heal the sick. Do all these things wonderful things outside the doors and you're going to see natural growth and uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that 
you know, there's a passage over in Luke 17, 14, where Jesus sends out the ten lepers. And as it says, as they went, they were made whole. Uh, they weren't made whole on the spot. It says, as they went away to go to the, show themselves to the priests, uh, they were made whole. They were healed. And uh, there's something to that thing of going, you know, going out, uh, being deliberate in uh, our desires to see the kingdom of God become reality. And, um, you know, not only has our growth not been very fast over the last eight years, but we've gradually lost a lot of members, too. And, and many of them have been pillars and, you know, advisory board members. And uh, just losing Pam and Doug, you know, brings us to mind again. You hate to see anyone leave, but especially uh, pillars of our church that uh, helped raise it up and found it. And um, this, com you know, when we look at this combined with the fact that we're no doubt going to be moving over the next year, you know, I, I think it makes this a real good time for us to do some self-evaluation, do some self-examination. Um, as I say, I'm not great at evangelism, and I don't know how many of you feel like you have the gift of evangelism. But um, that's not really the issue. The issue is that uh, we need to bloom where we are planted to do the best we can with what we have. And First Peter 2.9 tells us that we're all priests. We've all been given um, the anointing of the good news, the anointing of the perfect finished work of Christ the good news of what he's done for us. And um, I think really focusing on what this means this next year, and uh, regardless of whether we buy or rent, uh, you know, the more important thing is that we grow. I really think, uh, and, and part of this, a lot of this, you know, I, I don't think I have modeled this that well. I, I have a tendency in my work and stuff to share the gospel a lot and, and share spiritual things a lot, but not necessarily invite people to the church or that kind of thing. You know, my theology is more just build the kingdom of God. I'm not here to try to get people to come to my church. But, you know, the Lord kind of convicted me that I, I, I over go overboard in that direction. Um, you still want to be growing the church as well. And I think the each one reach one model is one that we can really think about this next year. And you might say, well, how? How do we do that? A and I think the most effective way that we do it is to look for people who are lonely or hurting or depressed right now, people who are going through hard things, people who don't have a place uh, that they really feel a support system and invest in at least one person or one couple or one family's life over the next year and invest in that life to the degree that it really makes a huge difference for them. Uh, the Lord uses you to really meet a need that was very genuine and uh, someone needed to meet. And uh, you know, if each of us do that over this next year, either as couples or individuals, in our workplace or wherever it happens to be, neighborhood, family, on the streets, in the marketplace, wherever it happens to be, uh, if we were to make that a goal, you know, we just talked about the pledge being something for us to pray about and think about, I'd like to throw this out as well, for us to pray and think about how I'm going to invest this year in someone's life in such a way that it makes such a difference to them that they want to be part of our spiritual family. And that's not even about theology. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think most people come into the kingdom by theology. I think most people come into the kingdom by love and care and nurture and, and people showing a concern for them and investing in their lives. And, and all of us can do that. We don't need to know theology. But 1 Peter 3.15 does say, be able to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope 
that lies within you. And we have to say, well, why would they ask? They ask because they see a difference. They ask because they see a security and a peace and a joy and a fulfillment that they don't have and that they want. Uh, that's why they ask, well, what's different about your life? What's different about your support system? How can I get more of what you have? Um, and, and we need to, you know, obviously it's, it's easy in our day and age to be complacent. You know, I'd rather just study and read and write books and uh, do the things that I really enjoy doing and not necessarily be out trying to invest in someone's life. But God says, hey, come on, this other stuff is what the kingdom's all about, investing in people's lives. And that's what Jesus did. He invested in people's lives. So I hope over this next year um, we can each be prayerfully thinking about this and really making it a goal uh, to see a year from now. Um, you know, if all of us took this seriously, our church would be approximately twice as big, nearly twice as big is what it is now. And we haven't had growth anywhere near like that over our first eight years of existence. So uh, I just throw that out today because I felt like the Lord was laying it on my heart and I'm preaching to myself every bit as much as I'm preaching to any of you. But uh, my hope and prayer is that each one will reach one. God bless you.